is Ken Rakowski, and uh, thanks a lot for hanging out. So hopefully I'll entertain you, show you some really cool stuff. My whole topic is all around the idea of, of the future of entertainment. This kind of gives you an idea. I asked Siri today, play me some cool music, and it told me, hey, I have no cool music whatsoever. So I know where things are starting. Uh, every time I go to a city, I always go and check Tinder to see what's out there, and I was a bit lost when I saw this. I'm not sure what's going on here, but this is a very progressive family. Uh, so, first, a couple things about me. I run an organization called METAL, which stands for Media uh, Entertainment Technology Alpha Leaders. Uh, and what we do is kind of like, uh, think about TED uh, with Jon Stewart running it. Every single Saturday, I get about two to 300 people together. And these are some of the speakers that come. And we have 1,600 members. And we've done about $3.5 billion in deal flow just last year alone. So it's a very prominent, powerful group that gets together on a regular basis which has allowed me to really see where things are going. Also, back in the 90s, this is a photo of me from 1996. I started the podcasting industry back in the 90s. So uh, back in the 90s when it was just an idea, I met Rob Glazer, Rob Glazer hooked me up Mark Cuban, and really got the whole idea of broadcasting over the internet going. Which leads me into where I'm at today. Today I am, uh, the host of a uh, radio show, which is on about 175 stations across North America. I'm here in Canada also. And basically it's a two hour show called Business Rockstars, where we interview the rock stars in the business industry. So we see the Bonos of the world being the Mark Zuckerbergs or the, um, the Richard Bransons. They're the ones that are making the changes. So I get them to teach people how to start growing fun businesses. I interview about four people every single day, so over the course of several years, I've had a few thousand people that I've had in my studio. So today, what I'm gonna do is, oh, by the way, these are my, my partners. Uh, Steve Lehman created Premier Radio Network, which uh, was the largest radio network on the planet. Andy Schoen, who uh, co-founded uh, Revolt with P. P. Diddy, is also my partner, Tom Beers, who runs Fremantle, so Deadliest Catch, Ice Truckers, uh, Storage Wars, those are all his shows. So the four of us together are business rock stars. So this is what I'm going to do. I want to start with a, a buddy of mine. This is Peter Diamantis. And Peter Diamantis runs a very, very interesting organization. One's called Singularity University, which he runs with Ray Kurzweil, who's been on the cover of Time Magazine seven times. And he also runs the X Prize, all around doing incredible things like flying um, a reusable space module up, landing it, and going back as a competition. Bert Rattan won that, and that became Virgin Galactic. Peter was recently talking about the whole idea of where industries are going, and I wanted to share this with you. Check this out. We're going to an age where linear companies, the old way of thinking, is being displaced by innovation and exponential companies. And for those of you who know Kodak's slogan, I've given this a name, I call this the new Kodak moment. So here are some of the numbers. Why innovation is so critical because in the next 10 years, 40% of the Fortune 500 companies will no longer exist. They will go the way of Kodak. Put a different way, if you look at this, this is from Professor Foster at Yale. If you started a company in the 1920s, you had a 67 year runway. You could start a company and for 67 years run that company knowing full well you had it for the rest of your life. Today, if you start a company, the average life of an S&P 500 company is reduced down to 15 years. MySpace gets replaced by Facebook, gets replaced by Google Plus. I don't think so. The rate of innovation and disruption is skyrocketing. The rule is, if you do not disrupt yourself, someone else will. That's the world we're living in today, where a young team of innovators and entrepreneurs can do what only governments and the largest corporations could do before. Really important, if you don't disrupt yourself, someone else will. So what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna take the cat out of the bag and I'm gonna talk about the future of entertainment and how it's gonna be funded right away. I'm gonna kinda of say what generally is left for last and put it right at the beginning. And let's just talk about the obvious that's out there. And that is, if we go look at the, let's call them traditional media environments, these are the big five that we all know about, TV, radio, print, direct mail, and billboard. If you ask them a very simple question, and the question is, hey, what is your product? They all generally say the exact same thing. Well, our content, that's our product. If you ask them this, another question is, who's your customer? Well, they say, hey, it's the audience. Now, if you go to new school media and ask them in reverse, who's your customer? 
They're going to see the advertiser. And what's your product? It's the audience. They realize that if the audience is there, they can sell that audience to an advertiser. Old school media didn't figure that out until recently. And it took them to change hands and ownership. Washington Post now is owned by the guy that started Amazon.com <laughs> because he gets it. So let's go through this whole process and understand. For example, let's, let's go to the whole Google sphere. You got Google, Google's got 171 free products for you. 171 that are out there. Those are apps and tools that you could use on a regular basis. Well, why are they free? Well, they're free because you are the product. They want you to do stuff to understand you, to get you to be understood. So an advertiser can say, hey, I know I'm gonna sell a Jeep to this person, or I know this person's about to have a baby because I see what they do with our apps and tools. Who here uses Waze? Waze, that's it? Are you serious? Okay, you gotta use Waze. Waze is one of the smartest, coolest apps out there. It's a social traffic app. So as you're driving, it'll tell you where cops are, it'll tell you where there's speed traps, it'll tell you where there's traffic, it'll tell you what speed a lane on a highway is going. Because everybody that has a Google app installed or an Android phone, it uses them as a tool, as a product to determine velocity and direction. Pretty powerful. So let's go through this whole idea. Since you are the product, I wanna give you an idea. Who's got an Android phone? Does your battery suck? Yeah, yeah. let me tell you why. This is the first thing is understand an Android is an operating system. It's not an Android phone. It's the Android operating system on the phone. And it's a free operating system. It costs nothing for Samsung or whoever the handset man manufacturer is. They get the operating system for free. There's got to be a trade-off. Why would they give it to them for free? Well, this is what happens. So every 30 to 60 seconds, your phone, your Android phone is doing this. Hey, let me look at your call volume, not the not how loud it is, but how often are you making calls? Let me go look at your latitude and longitude. Let me go make sure we understand what open Wi-Fi is out there. Open Bluetooth. I also want to see uh, light sensitivity by turning on the camera and sound sensitivity by turning on your microphone, and it reports it all back to Google. Your phone does that once to twice every minute. You know why? It's because the operating system's for free. And Google needs to know you better since you're the product so it can report back to its advertiser potential opportunity pretty scary. But this is where everything is going to be paid for in the future because we don't want to pay for stuff, most of us. We want it for free. So you have to be out there and available to give everything, anything regarding your privacy up. Same thing in Facebook. You go to Facebook. I am a big Facebook freak. I love Facebook. I love Facebook photos. You know, here's my photos. Now, of course, Facebook's asking, hey, is this Jules? Is this Alicia? It wants to make sure that the face identity goes with that person so it can start to customize who they are and peg information to them. For example, in Google Plus, you take a photo on Google Plus, just a photo I took yesterday. I just took the photo and I looked inside Google Plus. Look at all the information regarding that one photo. And this is a small amount of information that's there because Google, again, wants to know me better. So it could give me more important ads. Because remember, advertisers are going to subsidize the cost for entertainment. Got it? Yes, Ken. Got it? Yes. Good, okay, let's move forward. Wow. Let's go into the future of radio. I'm gonna try to hit every one of these areas. I'm not gonna go too far into the future because I think it's kind of ridiculous. We could predict anything we want. Let's talk about what's going on, let's say in the next 12 to 24 months. Something that we could see the pain that they're going through or something they don't understand. Or if you're in the radio, who's in the radio industry? Tough industry, huh? Yeah. Okay, so let's look at some ways to tweak up your industries and make it a little better. We're just going to touch upon two things. First, let's look at the radio market in Canada. 1,500 radio, or 1,100 radio stations in the United States, about 10 times more. I mean, it's, it's, it's much bigger in the United States, obviously. But these are two industries that go through ebb and flows, ups and downs. If you've got a good radio station, great. If you've got a so-so one, it gets really tough to compete. But we're going to touch upon just two things. One is engagement, and the other one's podcasting. You're going, oh, that's so boring. Well, not necessarily. Let's look at engagement real quick. If a radio station is not using all four of these tools, they are missing out. Yes, they should be using LinkedIn also. You should be using LinkedIn. If you are an artist, you are an entrepreneur. And if you're not treating yourself like a business, you're missing out on opportunities. Treat yourself like a business. 
Radio stations have to do the same thing. You have to use all four of these, but you also have to use Instagram. Instagram, if it was a separate company, it'd be worth $40 billion right now. $40 billion if Instagram was separate. Well, how about this? Check this one out. Ryan Seacrest is absolutely everywhere. He said he sits there in his radio booth in the morning with eight screens in front of him because it's all about consumer engagement. People aren't just calling in anymore saying what tunes they want. They're tweeting, they're WhatsApping, they're Snapchatting. And I had to say, what is your favorite social media form of communication? What do you think he picked? I don't know, quite honestly. Well, here you go. Take a look. Ah. I like what Snapchat is doing right now. I, I mentioned them earlier. I think that, um, that that's, a, that's a great app. I don't know if anybody's on it, but you know, you can be. Yes, Mostly for sexting, not. really. No one, is, no one is sexting right now. <laughs> How do you, you might know? Be. Why? Why do you Raise your hand if you're sexting right now. We're going to make it better. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Uh, but I, it, why, I like, why Snapchat? I, I like it. I mean, I, I think it's... Wait, um, before you answer, are you invested in Snapchat? I'm not. All right, got to ask. I'm he not, is. I, I, I didn't Only you would have to ask that. I would. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would. No, I didn't, are I'm, you invested in it? I'm not. Okay, so it's I didn't make an investment in Snapchat. I, I should have. Uh, but I think there's something interesting in, in, uh, to being able to post a video or photo and knowing that it's going to disappear. I mean, I think why? That, Wouldn't you want it to, to... No. What are you posting? You should see what we're posting. We want it yeah, to go but away. Why would you want it to go away? I've seen my pictures. I want them to go away immediately. Uh, but I think that's why millennials are, are using it. Millennials are using it. They're using it so much that the company's worth five plus billion dollars, if not more. And the, high, the idea is instantaneous. I need to know if it goes away, I'll miss out. It's a smart move. It really is. So Seacrest says it's all around Snapchat. There's another one you have to add to your list of things you got to do radio. Chris Hartwood is a buddy of mine, and uh, he, of course, is a big Periscope guy. I'm not sure who's, anyone using Periscope? All right, so Periscope, if you haven't seen it, this technology's been around for a while, actually. This whole uh, Ustream's been out there, but Periscope's integrated stuff inside Twitter. It's a company that was acquired by Twitter. So this is gonna be on Conan tonight. So Chris is on Conan O'Brien tonight, and this is Chris yesterday on his Periscope feed. This is what he's doing. Hey, I'm backstage at the Conan O'Brien show. These are people We're taping tomorrow's to the, show now. I'm to in the between screen. at midnight episode tapings because we tape tomorrow's show for at midnight tonight as well. So I, I just thought it'd be fun to show you the walk out from backstage. This is this is backstage. That's JP. So this is backstage at Conan. That's not that's not actually Conan. That's just a statue of Conan. Oh, they just announced the name. There he is. There's Conan's big mug up there on the thing. So lifelike. So, uh, Matt Weiner's going to be on the show, too. He's also on the podcast today. And, uh, I don't know. So, 1,100 people joined that stream right away. 1,100, unannounced, by the way. He wasn't saying, hey, I'm going to do this at seven minutes after five. It's right away. People jump on 1,100 people. My buddy Tom Green, Canadian, is right now, if you follow Tom Green on Periscope, he's doing a Periscope almost every nine to 12 minutes. He's doing something different because he's launching his new network and he's getting you excited. He wants you to say, use Periscope to drive you to his new radio slash TV show. So if you're not using Periscope, you're missing out. It's a great, great tool. Okay, so we got Periscope now to add to your list. I want to say just old school newsletters. Every one of you, if you have a product to sell and if you don't have a product's an artist, if you don't have a newsletter that's going out at least once a week, once a week, you're missing out a connection point. Newsletters are so insanely powerful and you own that person's email address, a newsletter. And last is events. Does anybody here know who Dave Ramsey is? Dave Ramsey, let me tell you about Dave Ramsey. Talks about getting out of credit card debt and how to fix your mortgage. Dave Ramsey makes between two to three hundred million dollars a year with a radio show. And he actually pays to be on radio in different markets. The reason why is because he does live events that get 15,000 people to show up. And he does a few of those every month. So it's about live events. Radio stations, local radio stations need more live events with the local community. Big markets, big opportunities. This right here, engagement, super easy. Let's just go to podcasting real quick. Podcasting, okay, sounds simple, right? I gotta tell you about this guy right here. Has anybody ever heard of the, uh, the podcast called Entrepreneur on Fire? You have. There's a podcast, does a little podcast, podcast, not radio show, podcast, 
online, it's a video feed. He's not that good, by the way. Fun guy, but he doesn't have any radio experience at all. He posts his monthly revenue, he's very transparent, on what he makes every month on his website. This podcast made net $2.1 million last year. Podcast. I know radio stations that don't make that. His kid's overhead is his bedroom. Okay? Podcast. Podcasts are so insanely powerful. And everyone's going to say, oh, God, it's been around since the 90s, since Ken invented it. Um, podcasts are now becoming more practical because people are on the go and they're actually looking for other alternatives than just music. And the podcast store in both Google and Apple, it's fortified with great stuff. Podcast radio, your radio stations out there, or if you want to get on radio, go to a radio station in your community going, hey, let me do a half hour show and let me put it on your website. It's a great way, I got trialed that way. Trial yourself with your local radio show, our station saying, let me do a podcast for you. You tell me if you like it. If you like it, then maybe you could graduate me to traditional radio. So try it out. Got it? Got it. Good. Let's go to something else. Let's talk about the future of TV. It's all over the top. Everybody's going to hear about over the top now. This is it. This is the future, and it's happening now. These are new networks. You know every one of them probably. They're networks now. We pay subscriptions for some of them. We watch only them. We don't even watch streaming or real TV anymore. Hey, if you got Google Plus, or excuse me, if you got uh, Netflix, HBO, Amazon Prime, Hulu, you got everything. Plus HBO, you don't even really need TV. There's enough live streaming on this stuff now. I watch Bloomberg through Amazon Prime and it's live and it's streaming. I watch Sky News, live and streaming. I don't pay for any of those. I, well, I pay Amazon Prime. I pay for, I guess I do pay. Um, <laughs> But this is it, and these are the new, let's call them networks that are delivering it, meaning these are the new, um, they're like the conglomerates, Samsung TVs, TiVo, Google TV, which we'll touch upon, uh, even Microsoft, if you tried Xbox, you can actually watch networks inside their TV channels and all that. They're the new delivery mechanism. It's disrupting everything that's out there. You don't see Motorola up there anymore. You don't see the old school names. These are the new players. Let me give you an example, Google Fiber. Does anybody have Google Fiber here? No, it's like a wet dream. Okay, let me tell you why. No, I'm not kidding. It's, it's like a wet dream. Google Fiber, if you're in one of these cities, especially when it says current Google Fiber cities, you have a gigabit of bi-directional, we call it synchronous bandwidth, a gigabit, right? You got a terabyte server. This is all in your house. Everything's set up, they come to your house, plus you get, I think, 150 channels for 130 bucks a month. Okay, you're not shocked. Like, I pay 290 a month and I get half of that, right? This is amazing, and this is Google. Google is the network, they're the carrier, they're the ones that are bringing it all to you. So Google is the game, in the game now. Google Fiber, you'll start seeing it roll out throughout North America aggressively. I wouldn't be surprised to see it, not in Toronto, but I would probably see it in uh, areas like, it's gotta be very flat. They try to do as flat cities as possible to roll it out. So whatever your flattest, what's, your, what's a big flat city out here? Maybe Winnipeg, why don't you guys fight? Uh, Winnipeg, we'll probably get it then there. Uh, the end of this month is the end of the upfronts. We're talking about the future TV. This is pretty mind blowing. So the upfronts focus on prime time. Prime time, of course, is between eight o'clock and 11 o'clock at night. That's prime time and upfronts are, what are we going to pay for to be an advertiser during these shows? We get to see all the latest and greatest TV shows and they bid it. Started at the end of February to about now. This is interesting. So last year, or this year, we're looking at about $8.4 billion. Or last year, $8.4 billion. The year before, it was 9.2. What are you saying? The year before that was 10.2. It keeps on going down as we get closer to now. They're thinking it might be low $8 billion this year, meaning advertisers are spending less on television. We're talking about the future of TV. Well, where's the future if they're spending less on television? It's pretty interesting. I think one, you know, oil going down means people have more money to spend and not watching as much TV. Let's face it, at least in my country, the dollar is strong. People are saying, let's just go spend more money. Binge watching is out there, it's like crack, right? People want to just binge watch everything. I hate when something I can't binge watch. And then YouTube. And I would also say programming is so bad. TV executives are just morons, they're idiots. They don't know how to program properly, and that's one of the problems too. Let me give you an example. Let's look at the top five TV stars. Here they are, here's the top five. 
These are the highest paid, highest audience. If you go look at their highest rated show, this is the amount of viewers they had for those shows. Okay? Let's go look at the top four YouTubers. Oh, by the way, there's seven, seven, what is it? Seven, six point seven. So that's the amount of viewers if you combine all of those together. Top four YouTubers. Here they are. You no know, Pootie Pie? Right? You guys know Pootie Pie? Jenna Marbles. If you look at these, these are their subscribers. These are their subscribers. So if you add that together, look at about 82 million combined subscribers. This is where it gets more interesting. If you look at what these actors and actresses get paid, this is what they get paid. So you're looking at a total of $184 million to pay these actors and actresses to be at that level. These YouTubers, <laughs> you're looking at a fraction, about $20 million. And I didn't include views. If I looked at views for these YouTubers, they would annihilate television. Now here's the big key. It's about 98% lower to create a YouTube TV show per se, or video than it is for a traditional TV. This is where the big sea change is. YouTube or YouTube stars are where it's hot. Like for example, this is what's being watched on YouTube right now in the US. This is for all guys. Same thing with girls. Right now, and this is a, a video, this is a um, Fast and Furious video that's being watched right now. Now I can break it down a little more. Let me change the demographics to about 35 to 45. Now we can see what guys are watching. We can see what girls are watching, the same thing. I can't do this with TV. I can't real time see what's going on. With YouTube, I can, I can micro fraction to see what's going on in different cities, towns, real time, age groups. Where do you think the advertisers are going to spend more time? It's right here. This is the micro target. So where are the sharks right now? Those are the sharks about to destroy the gigantic networks. Because these networks cannot do what these networks can do on the bottom. Future TV is going to switch to an interactive world that is an online world. And it's going to happen. The younger generation, who here doesn't even have a TV subscription? There you go. That speaks volumes. All right, let's go uh, after print. Future print. I think it's kind of cool. I'm going to show you something interesting. I was a whole big fan of the whole Harry Potter newspaper. Didn't you wish that would exist? Well, it kind of does. This is a company I'm actually involved with out of Indonesia, out of Jakarta. And what it is, it takes traditional print and it turns it into AR. And this is real time. This is real. This is where print is going to go. So I took a little brochure. This is a little home brochure. Took a regular phone. This is a smartphone. Hello. Elsie's going to bring her phone. This is a Samsung phone. And come close to the brochure. And you can see it's in 3D. So as you move the brochure around, full 3D. And then what you can do is from there, you can dive into the actual home. So you can move the home around and you can see the inside of the home. I'm moving, I'm manipulating. Isn't that cool? Let's take it uh, outside the real estate industry. I mean, that's kind of cool. Let's go to something that's a little more fun. Let's go to the play world. So think about baseball cards or whatever. Look at this. Right from a flat card, there's your augmented reality, using existing reality, having some fun with it. Let's go to another card. Again, this is real, this is now. There's the card, there's the animation, put them together, they notice one another, there's a series of programs, let's start to fight, there you go. <laughs> this is Star Wars, do you remember the chess set? This is it right here. This is today. The company's called Weir, W-I-R, out of Indonesia, if you wanted to go check them out. But real-time, augmented reality, this is what's gonna save print. Print will start doing more and more augmented reality. And we'll see that happen. So let's talk now and last about what's going on with film. Film is fascinating to me. I'm not sure if what you guys think about going to a movie. Do, do you guys still go to a movie? Movie? What was the last movie you saw? Who saw The Avengers? Good? Who gives it more than a eight? Really? Did you see it? God. All right, did you like Fast and Furious also? Okay, okay, you got some taste. Um, let's, uh, check us out. Uh, this is the only thing I can do. I draw to relax, I draw to find ideas. I've always been drawing, uh, so it's not work, it's just life. Cars are my toys, I'm playing with toys all, all my life. 
You have to know the brand first in order to design Bentley. Our this is shot with an iPhone 5 S. But yet, we're respecting our tradition. This is always uh, starting point when we design Bentley. My name is Luke Donkerwalk and I'm uh, head of design for Bentley. My name is Sangya Lee. I'm a head of exterior design at Bentley Motors. Shot with an iPhone 5S. Filmmakers have just basically stepped up because the cost to get in the game is dramatically dropped. This is a little software tool that you can use right now. It's, I think it's $7 and it does what a lot of the big cameras do. It turns your iPhone into a mega powerhouse. Now, of course, you need some add-ons. I mean, you can see what it does. It's unbelievable what the software does. Just giving you great night shots. So this is the setup for under $200. You can literally have a camera that would rival a $3,000 Canon. Price to entry has just come down. Right? We could all become great filmmakers as long as you have a good story. <laughs> That's the key. But this is where it's going right now. The whole future of film is basically allow all of us to get involved. I'm excited about this. And it's so good that iPhone 5 films were featured at Sundance this year in 1-1. This is kind of like when the bread came out. Do you remember that? All right, Fast and Furious. Got to talk about this real quick. Okay, movie, I'm kind of sick of Vin Diesel, I don't know about you guys. But what's more amazing is this, right? What they did with Paul Walker was amazing. If you'd sit there and try to figure it out where it was and where it wasn't, where they've actually modified, I want to go back in time real quick and kind of show you where this has gone and why this is a big deal right now. So if you go back in time, anybody remember this movie? The Crow, right? The Crow was in 1992. This is what happened, he was killed. He was killed during the filmmaking, very similar to what happened to Walker. 1992, this is what they had to do to make it This work. may look like Brandon Lee, but it is not. You are watching a body double. A computer electronically replaced his face with this close-up of the real Brandon Lee. The most difficult scene is this five-second shot of Lee returning to his apartment. It is crucial to the plot, but it was never filmed. Fortunately, this footage of Lee in a rainy alley was. Of course, there was very limited footage of him without makeup. Step one, creating a digital moving outline. We use this, if you will, as a cookie cutter, which allows us to stamp his image, pull him from the, uh, back, uh, from the alleyway scene, and place him into the actual scene that we want him. A shot of the empty apartment becomes the background. It was also necessary for us to add some drips of rain in his apartment to make it look as if it was uh, or leaking, through, leaking the roof. through the roof. Right. Then, with the aid of computers, Brandon Lee walks into a scene he never really shot. And I think translated into hours, that's probably between five and 650 uh, hours, 500 to 650 hours uh, of direct labor on this shot. Yeah. <laughs> It's a lot of work just for that one shot. Now that something happens regularly, every actor now of a featured film, featured film goes through something called body casting, where they actually stand and they take 3D shots of their entire body and it goes into the archives in case something happens to them. Now realize that even people that are not with us anymore have an opportunity, especially their states, to make money. Audrey Hepburn, let's, let's look at her for a second. Notice, did anybody remember this Gap commercial back in 2006? I rather feel like expressing myself now. And I could certainly use a release. We're not inhibited. The girl wants to dance. The girl wants to dance. There's nothing more than a form of expression or release. The girl wants to dance. The girl wants to dance. Her estate got a half a million dollars for that. Doesn't exist anymore, right? Audrey Hepburn's back. Let's do one last one real quick. 1982 is when this came out. What movie would it be? It would be, it would be Tron. Do you remember Tron? Jeff Bridges and all that? Well, of course, 30 years later, they wanted to do Tron 2. Tron 2, how are they gonna go back in time to get an older Jeff Bridges, or younger Jeff Bridges? They went to a movie called Against All Odds. Against All Odds was in, uh, 2000, I mean, uh, 1984, and they took this scene right here. So what is it you don't like exactly? Uh, football players, tacos, or beer? 
I like tacos and I like beer. They took that scene of Jeff Bridges. They removed, I can't wait to see what that says. 10 minutes? Okay, right, just yell it. All right, this is what they did. They took Jeff Bridges and they did this. I created the perfect system. The thing about perfection is that it's unknowable. It's impossible, but it's also right in front of us all the time. You wouldn't know that because I did it when I created you. This is how they did that scene. Now, the reason I'm bringing all this up is you can now use older imagery, stuff that's out there, and bring it to life. I know there's a Humphrey Bogart movie that's being made right now, set today, of him being a detective. It's being designed right now because there's enough imagery of Humphrey Bogart to do that. It's mind-blowing where film's going. Also, the idea of constructing in film. Check that out. This is the new technology around the idea of where we can construct anything in 3D to make it look real. on his Mac. <laughs> so where we're at right now with software, what tools, we can totally change the way things are. Who here is in print? No one in print, just one person. What do you do in print? You're in management. So you can kind of float anywhere you want to go then, right? What do you do? You're a creative agency. So you work in print, you work in interactive and all that, right? You're one of the best places to be because you get to float. Because right now, let me give you an example. This is where creative has gone. Creative has gone this way. Let's take something from the old. Let's use it to move forward, OK? So an ad would be this. How do we get eyeballs on something that's old school, mixing new school? And this is the ad that was, uh, if you first thing is, you know, of course, who saw this movie? Yeah, it, was it as good as Fast and Furious 7? No. You know they're making a remake. And making a remake with these, these four. And I'm not sure if you know the whole story. They're the daughters of the original, that's the whole idea of the new Ghostbusters. Well, we know that Harold Ramis isn't with us anymore, but he is in the movie. They're, they basically have enough imagery to put him in the movie, so who's not here anymore on this planet could still be in film, so Harold Ramis will be there. But I think it's more interesting when you take something from the old and mix it with the new, something like this. Marsha, what happened? Peter hit me in the nose with a football. I can't go to the dance like this. Well, I'm sure it was an accident, sweetheart. An eye for an eye. That's what Dad always says. I never said that, honey. Shut up! Time to teach Peter a lesson. Marsha, eat a Snickers. Why? You get a little hostile when you're hungry. Better? Better. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Jan, this isn't about you. It never is! <laughs> The future of television goes right back to advertisers. Advertisers are what's going to pay for everything we do. I hate to tell you that. The more you give them, the more they will take. And if you think you have to, I'm serious, and if you think you can block them from you, you can't. There was an interesting study that was done back when Echo Star was called Echo Star before it was, then became Dish, and Direct TV, and they watched people watch TV for a month. And I don't mean watching with a camera, but watch how they used a remote, what they fast forward, what they rewind, what they watch during certain times. Within one month, besides knowing if they're male or female, young or old, even religion, they knew if they were a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi drinker based upon what they watched and how they did. Advertisers and the technology around it is super sharp and smart, and it's going to dive into all your businesses. My suggestion is find a way to work with them and build things with them. You're not selling out because they're gonna figure a way to get into your stuff, but they have the money, and I believe there's opportunity there. I really do. That's kind of the future of what's going on with entertainment, and I wanna thank you for uh, sharing time with me. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs> Any questions? So today nope. you've seen like,
everything's changing and this is what's next, but what are the things that are not going to change about us, about us consumers? Like, you know, some can change tomorrow in the next five minutes, but what are the things that are always for us good principles to have of what is not going to change in terms of humans, the way we consume content? I just want to get some general principles. I'm going to say first between Gen Xers like myself, Gen Yers, and then the, the new group, um, I think there's major differences between all of us, right? I was in the generation where I had to actually go up and change the dial on a TV, right? You laugh, but I'm, it's still there, right? You had remotes, and kids today don't even have TVs. I think we're all going to go different phases of what we're willing to accept. I'm willing to accept stuff like that. You aren't. And then a younger generation doesn't even tolerate it. So when you say what's not going to change, I think in our different genres or age groups, they're going to be radically different. But what is going to change, our positive change in your group, a millennial, is you are the fastest growing, strongest generation of knowledge right now. So you have the ability to take, I posted a video uh, on my Facebook and I, I'm able to look at who of my friends liked it. And the millennials liked it faster than my Gen Xers friends. And that video then spread through the millennial side. I got almost four million views on Facebook alone, and it was only because of the millennials, it wasn't the Gen Xers. Millennials are the fastest at spreading a message. You're the strongest when it comes to external communication. The poorest when it comes to one-on-one -on -one communication, right? It's true. You know, what is going to stay the same? Text messaging. You know, Ralph Simon, I'm not sure if you guys know Ralph. Raise your hand, Ralph. I mean, that's the father of the ringtone. I mean, you really got text messaging going and all that. And it's, it, you, there, premium text messaging may not be a big thing, but text messaging still is hotter than hell, right, Ralph? Trillions, trillions. Yeah, trillions and trillions. Another thing is, has anybody, uh, does anybody use, what's, who uses WhatsApp? Okay, how about uh, Facebook Messenger? So I want you to go into Facebook Messenger if you've upgraded the app in the last month and go to the bottom and select somebody's name and you'll see all the new apps that are inside Facebook Messenger. Facebook is creating their own app store, which either they're gonna stay inside Google or inside iOS or they'll be kicked out. But what's going to change is every one of these platforms, Facebook is gonna become its own network. And they're gonna have their own TV shows. Google's doing the same thing. But you'll watch it, you'll watch on your mobile. Where do you watch TV? I just have a Netflix. A Netflix account, that's all you have, right? That's all you need. That's not gonna change, by the way. <laughs> Anyone else, any other questions? Back there, you don't have to yell. I didn't get a chance to see Zeppelin or, or the Beatles or anything. What do you think about a digital image of them and people going to watch that? I'm sure Gene Simmons is all over it. <laughs> uh, Gene's tried it, but I'm going to say it's more like on the Will I Am side. Uh, we've seen this happen with uh, Tupac. You know, saw this about three years ago. We're seeing the digital imagery they call them holographics. There's a lot of companies that are rolling out. Actually, out of Los Angeles seems to be this new holly, uh, they're calling it a holographic capital. There's about 12 companies that are competing for this space, which is great. And we'll see more holographic images coming out. I know that several artists will be launching stuff this year. But when it comes down to the consumer side, I think that's when it becomes more viable. Because it's still fairly expensive. To create that ribbon to where they actually project the hologram in, it's about $20,000 it's still too expensive for the average consumer or even the startup artist to use. When it comes down in cost, then we'll start seeing it. The more projection we're seeing is on projection on steam. I'm not sure if you've seen this, where it's a mist, very similar to this, a little more aggressive, and you actually project on the mist. That's a lot less expensive. It's, it's using, it's called fog projection, and it looks like holographics, which is pretty cool. Any other questions? Is the next movement, I think, uh, maybe um, content on those uh, platforms? Is that, do you see that coming? Do you see maybe uh, artists using that as a tool to uh, generate revenues or, or anything of that nature? So I went to the F1 conference, which was the Facebook conference that took place a couple of months ago, and Oculus was everywhere, and there, there, there's developers inside there. A lot of porn, by the way, FYI. Um, there is. I, I think right now we're like the, the Apple Watch, we're Rev1 and it's still fairly expensive, it's gotta come down in price and it's gotta streamline. If you go look at what Microsoft has launched or they're trying to launch by the end of the year, it's streamlined, it's better. Um, the goal is you'll see more virtual reality, which is not augmented reality, come out probably two to three years from now as prices come down and the actual equipment looks a little better. That's it, I'm wrapping up. Thanks a lot for joining me and have a great time at the event. Thank you everyone.